Well, we just want to welcome today Erica Forensic. Hi, Erica. Hi, Doris. So good to be here. You're the Thank author you. of Girl in Ice. Yep. Uh, may I call it a chilling thriller? <laughs> <laughs> You may, Doris. You may. I, I think I've heard it all at this point, but yeah, chilling. Okay. Wear a sweater, right? Uh, right, right. Um, Valerie is a linguist specializing in language. Uh, tell us what motivates her to travel to the Gar Greenland. To Greenland. Well, so... Um, Girl in Ice is about an American linguist named Val, and she specializes in dead Nordic languages. And she is gets an email one day from Wyatt, who is up in a very remote, very remote climate research center off the coast of Greenland. And he tells her that a girl has been found in a glacier and she's thawed out alive and she's talking, but she's not speaking a language anyone understands. So Val is, you know, he's asking Val to go up there. Now, what you also need to know is eight months previous, Val's twin brother, Andy, was also a climate scientist, was working up with Wyatt in this very remote uh, climate research center off the coast of Greenland one night. Andy walks outside in his boxers, 50 degrees below zero and freezes to death. So one thought is suicide, obviously, but Val isn't so sure, knowing what she knows about her brother. So when she's tasked to go up to Greenland, it's a huge deal for her. She's also suffers from a great deal of anxiety, almost crippling anxiety. So. Uh, this is huge for her to, mm. to go up there. Hmm. And, and so, and so what, what is Wyatt doing? I mean, isn't he in research? So Wyatt is a climate researcher. He is, has been up there for only going on two years, pulling up ice cores and studying the climate. And he's up there with a woman named Jean. Jean is, um, an older woman who is basically the grunt who does all the machine repair work. She's the cook. Uh, so it's really just been them um, and Andy when he was up there. So, uh, yeah. What inspired you to write this story? Well, a, lot, a couple of things. There are like five things that inspired me. I, I, I'll tell you a couple of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing that inspired me is ever since uh, I saw a it was I think the first iteration of Frankenstein a 1931 black and white uh, iteration of Frankenstein there's a scene of Frankenstein Frankenstein's monster at the end of the movie and he's been hunted and he's bloodied and he's just given up on mankind and there's a scene of him and he's just he's turned his back on mankind and he's walking into this blizzard and he's this you know this blacky block silhouette and he's being devoured by this ravenous white blizzard and that image has stayed with me for over 40 years and I <laughs> have been trying to figure out what it what it means to me. And I'm still trying to figure it out. I, I mean, in the, I mean, hey, you know, books have been written in, about what it really means, what Frankenstein's monster really represents. But for me, it's when he turns away like that, he is, you know, it. it it's sort of, it's an indicator to me of, you know, humanity, humanity's intolerance for human variety. Mm. But there's also something weirdly hopeful about it because he has made the decision to turn away and to go into this forbidding environment to find what we don't know. But uh, there's just something, well, obviously it's a heartbreaking story. Here is this creature that mankind created, and yet we want to use it for all these different 
different reasons. Now, let me also clarify, there's no Frankenstein in Girl and Ice. But there is a story of life from suspended animation, let's call it, when the girl comes alive. So there was that. So that, that, that lived in my brain, you know, forever. The, the, but it really came about, the story came about, I was walking behind my house in the woods, lucky enough to have woods behind my house. And this was in the winter of 2018. And I, I walked by a pond and I saw three juvenile painted turtles along the edge and they were like, you know, mid stroke. And they, they were frozen, obviously, but, you know, they didn't look alive, but they didn't look dead either. Mm. So I, you know, ran home and I Googled, you know, things that can freeze and thaw out alive. And <laughs> turns out there's a number of creatures that can do that. Uh, certain crocodiles, certain species of beetles, caterpillar, uh, Arctic char can do it. Um, they, they've even, you know, even plants can do it. They've thawed out 100,000-year-old lichen under a heat lamp, and it sprouts. Amazing. So it's amazing. It, But so, you know, we can't, you know, freeze and thaw human beings yet. Um, but it is interesting that we can freeze embryos. I think that's interesting mm -hmm. and why is that now i'm not a scientist but what i read is that they're only these embryos are really only about 120 these blastocytes they're only about 120 cells and they figured out how to freeze something that small for whatever reason again i don't know how they do but the creatures that can do it possess a kind of cryoprotein that we do not possess so anyway that was a spark and i I thought, well, why not a girl in a glacier? And then I had to dial it way, way, way back and think, well, why is she there? What mm. is she doing there? And what is she trying to get away from? And so on and so forth. And so that's how that story came about. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Now, you. now you, you use a lot of foreign words, strange words, and yes. interesting words. Did I mean, do you speak other languages? Did you, did you have to do a lot of research for that? <laughs> yes, I, well, I, I did go to Greenland uh, for uh, close to a month. That was one thing. But I did study, I uh, did read books on linguistics. I do speak French, uh, not that I use it ever anymore. <laughs> but, um, and it was fascinating. Uh, I read books about Greenlandic language and what it was really really got me is you know we have words that are culturally specific for example there's a Japanese word and I think I'm pronouncing it right but it's shibui and shibui s-h-i-b-u-i is a Japanese word for the beauty of aging yeah. And we don't have that in our culture because we do not believe <laughs> there is beauty in aging. We believe there is beauty in youth and sexiness and, uh, and all of that. But that is a culturally specific word. And then I started studying, you know, Greenlandic words. And there's a word in Greenlandic for the feeling of being one with nature or being a part of nature. We don't have a word for that. I'm not going to try to pronounce these words for you. They're, right. they're, they're, they're multisyllabic. They're 26 letters long, and, and the pronunciation is beyond me. But there's also a word for climate change in Greenlandic. Really? And it <laughs> yes. And it translates to a friend acting strangely. So <laughs> that reveals so much about the Greenlandic culture, first of all, referring to the climate as a friend. Yes. We, we yes. have a, such a combative relationship to weather. Oh, a storm's coming. Oh, my God, it's horrible. What will we do? <laughs> as opposed to, I mean, a normal storm. I'm not talking about, you know, something cataclysmic, which we're all right to be fearful of. I understand that, but I'm just saying... You know, I live in the Northeast, and there's 
you can't even say snowstorm anymore. You say bomb cyclone. It's like, <laughs> dude, it's snowing. It's beautiful. Enjoy it. Go out and play and, you know, live your you, life. This is part right. of the world, you know. You, so anyway, the language I thought was fascinating. Um, and then I had to figure out, because this girl that thaws out from the ice, I can say her name is Sigrid. She refuses to talk. So even though Val, the linguist, knows ancient languages and has and wants to communicate with her, the girl is traumatized. She is doesn't know where she is. She doesn't she's like, where are my parents? <laughs> you know? <laughs> where am I? I don't recognize so she's not willing to communicate. And also the words that she's saying do not match anything that Val recognizes. So it's it's quite a journey for the two to come together and and work together to basically save Sigrid's life. Um, and you read the book, so I will Yes, I did. You know, it's a, it's yeah. a very, very interesting story indeed. Um, Thank you. You tell the story in first person. What yep. made you choose that literary style? Well, first person is great. We know it's great because you get really, you can get really, you can talk about the feelings of the protagonist, yet you're limited by the protagonist's point of view. You can't get in anyone else's head. You know, we all know that. Um, I wanted I think it's one of my favorite points of view. I find it the most powerful way to get the reader to feel the story. You know, perhaps it would be more skillful of me to use other points of view, but that, and, and a big part of what I'm trying to do is have the reader feel everything. That's why I go to these settings I want to bring everything that I can because, you know, the setting is, is a character unto itself. So. Well, your, your books are known for taking us out of our heads and into a wild world. You know, you, <laughs> you, you write adventure novels for women and um, it's just, uh, does, how did you get inspired to travel to such remote places? Well, I have to correct you a little because I think men love my books too, which is like, I want to, I want to clarify that because, um, yeah, definitely the female protagonist is important, but I think men do uh, enjoy it. I think it all started with the river at night when, which was my debut and the river at night. I should have it. Well, I do have it. But in any case, the river at night is about four women friends who go whitewater rafting in the, in the Allagash territory of Northern Maine. They lose the raft and have to survive not only the wilderness, but a mother and son who have disappeared themselves for their own tragic reasons. So think a little deliverance with women. Yes, yes. Right. So for that, I, I started to write it and I realized I've never been to the Allagash territory of Northern Maine <laughs> and I could go there. So I planned a trip. I planned a three week trip and I really needed to talk to off the gritters. So I didn't know any. So I just started making calls right up through Canada, the chambers of commerce. Do you know anyone? Do you know anyone? And they were like, Oh, they don't want to talk to you. They live off the grid. So I finally lined up like seven interviews, five men, and two families, five men yeah. living on their own. So I vetted them. You know, I talked to people who knew them, and I brought my mace, and I brought my, you know, I I made sure that I was as safe as I could and still get the interview. <laughs> um, my husband was, was not wild was about this ask trip. You if you, <laughs> I was just, <laughs> just going to ask you if you've ever been afraid traveling alone. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I have been afraid <clears> of <throat> traveling alone, but my relationship to fear has changed over these three trips. The trip to the Allagash Territory for the river at night, and then I spent a month in the Peruvian Amazon for Into the Jungle. Mm. And then I went to Greenland. Um, I think what I learned for being in the woods and 
talking to these people. Just how to trust my instinct with people, my instincts. Uh, it, when I was in the jungle, time does not allow for how much I learned. But one thing I really learned was the first two days with my guide, I was talking nonstop like I do now. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, like day two, he's like, Erica, you need to be quiet. I said, why? And he said, because I'm listening. And I'm listening not just to tell you about things, but to keep us safe, keep us oh, alive. Interesting. This guy could hear troops of monkeys from a mile away. He knew what kind they were, howler, titi, woolly. Mm. He knew how fast they were coming in and what direction. He could, he could hear with his feet. There are a kind of, it's a kind of pig called a white-lipped peccary in the jungle. Travel in herds, huge herds, very big, very dumb, very aggressive. And one day we were walking and he said, we need to find shelter right away. And I said, why? He said, because they're coming. There's a herd coming. And I, I just heard insects all day, all night, just insects, <laughs> crazy. So he said, we need to, so we took shelter behind this giant lupuna tree. It's a tree of like two school buses long. And we sort of went into its root system. And then all these pigs came and just thundered by us. And so I just learned about fear. By the time I left, uh, I felt differently about being in the jungle for sure. Wow. I learned about being aware of my surroundings, something that we don't have to do in our, in our temperature controlled, controlled environments. True. It blocks off certain sense, senses that I think are important to develop. True. And, True. Yep. And, and, now you've been writing for a long time. What forms do your writing, uh, does your writing take and What's your favorite form of writing? Uh, well, I've been writing uh, for 35 years, probably longer, but I can't do the math because it's too hard. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I started out writing novels, and my enthusiasm did not match my skill set. <laughs> oh, I love you that. You know, I was like, this is so great. No, they're horrible. But, and so from there, a, I segued to doing stand-up comedy. I did stand-up comedy for 10 years. I uh, did sketch comedy. And then from there, I talk about scary and, and learning to deal with fear. I mean, stand-up is, is oh. it, yeah, it's terrifying. You know, I had a love-hate with that. But from there, I went to screenwriting. I love screenwriting. But that screenwriting really taught me structure story structure but screenwriting is very difficult because uh, you know I, I was had by that time I was married and I had stepkids and uh, I want I had wanted to go to LA but then I changed my mind and I just also I'm not that collaborative I mean screenwriting is very you right. have to you know, give up so many <laughs> so much control and um, so I went back to novels I went back to novels after having gone through, you know, decades of learning. And I think it really, it really helped me out. Yeah. Well, and you earned your MFA in creative writing from Boston University. I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, tell us about your publishing journey. Was it difficult for you to get the first book published? And how did you handle rejection? Oh, yeah, I want to talk to all the all the writers out there who are working so hard and trying to get their novels published to just never give up hope. It is you're going to be a different writer in your 20s, in your 30s, in your 40s, in your 50s and beyond. And you need to respect and love each writer that you have been are and will be. Oh. I mean I was so rough on myself. I was 
I was terribly rough on myself. And you know what? It doesn't do you any good. Now, what does do you good is to learn, you know, keep those ears open. I'm not saying, you know, take every shred of advice, but keep learning. This is something that takes years to master. And I, every book I write, I'm like, what? How do you do this again? I have no idea. And, it, and, and it's a myth that it gets easier. It's still like climbing Everest without a Sherpa in business casual, you know, every time, every, every time. time it doesn't get <laughs> easier. But the important thing to remember is I think to, well, there's lots of things to remember. <laughs> if you really love it, you've got to schedule it into your life. You've got oh, to schedule cool. writing time into your life. You can't say, well, I'll do it at the end of the day. No, at the end of the day, you want a glass of wine and you want to go to Netflix or whatever, right? <laughs> right. That's what you want. That's what, certainly what I do. So <laughs> make it a part, make it a part of your life. It's, it's something that that's important to you. Well, you know, schedule it in. Um, and also no matter what criticism you get, just never forget that kernel of belief in yourself that got you into all this trouble in the first place. <laughs> and that should be kryptonite strong. That should be kryptonite strong, a belief that what you have to say has value to a reader. So that's very that's inspiring. That's very that's inspiring. It. And and you know it's true. All you authors out there, you know you have something to say. That's why you're doing this. And you can have people throwing swords at you all day long, and you've got to figure out how to negotiate that. I remember Stephen King had said something in his book, uh, I think it was in on writing, and he said, someone asked him, how do you feel when you publish a book? You must be so excited. And he goes, and this is politically incorrect, or, or <laughs> it's a da okay. dated comment, so please excuse the obnoxiousness of it in one way that he said, well, I feel like I'm, <laughs> when I publish a book, I feel like I'm naked and I'm running between two bands of Indians who are shooting arrows at my face. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm trying to dodge them. So... <laughs> Because it's true. You're like, oh, my God, it's a big lesson. Not everyone is going to love me. I should right. have learned that a lot. But you really learn it because you feel like, but you're my target audience. You know? Self-publishing? Not only did I consider it, <laughs> I actually did it. I did it three times. And I don't regret a thing. I, I have to say I did it after you know, years of rejection and, and being pissed off about it. But I, I learned so much about everything from editing to cover design, to marketing, to publicity, to who is my target audience, to how am I going to reach them? And I, I really did learn some, just how difficult it, it was, but why not learn that? Why not learn that? You know? Right. Um, and I published self-published quite a while ago when it was a sort of a freaky thing to do. Nobody was really <laughs> doing it. And and now it's quite it's quite uh, it's quite it's much more popular or common or something, but and the tools have changed and you know, oh, you yes. guys have much more power over what you're doing with your books you can be so creative use that creative license with everything from your cover to how you market it and then what did, how did you how did you decide to then to then try to seek out a publisher or an agent and how did you find mm -hmm. your agent well i was always seeking out an agent but then i just lost my patience and decided to self publish i've had five agents i've i've written 11 books, uh, maybe more. <laughs> uh, about a dozen screenplays, hundreds of essays. Um, yeah. I've had books that went out with agents that didn't sell. 
You know, um, I've had agents that have left the business and therefore I've been agentless and had to find another. Uh, I've everything, everything you can think of, I think has happened. Uh, <laughs> but the day that I got the agent for the river at night, something did change. And I think I had, there's a, there's a, I live in, I live in the Boston area and there's a wonderful creative writing school here or community called Grub Street. And they, every year they have a conference it's called the Muse, the Muse yes. and the Marketplace. Of course, I'm sure you've heard of it. So what's wonderful about that name is I like to think that finally I wrote a book where the Muse, my Muse, intersected with the Marketplace. Oh, that's a good way to say it. So you think of it as two circles, right? And where there is that intersection is what I want, is the sweet spot I wanted to hit. And so how, after, did, you learn, how did you learn about your audience? Huh. Well, uh, what made you find your audience? I write books that I want to read that, as far as I know, aren't out there yet. You don't find your audience because, I, let me put it this way. We only ever have one brain, one set of eyes, one history, one voice, really. Unless, you know, you're writing different genres, perhaps you can do it. But, I mean, just generally. So, you're not, you're not finding your audience. I'm using that term. I know I've used it. <laughs> but you're not finding your audience so much as you're creating your own voice with the knowledge that you will have an audience who will be receptive to your voice. You can't change your voice to match an audience is what I'm saying. Don't go down that weird road. Be who you are. I tried to write romance once because I was like, oh, my God, they sell so much. All right. And I was like, oh, I got through one, three sentences. And I was like, this is, this is, <laughs> this is not me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you have to be who you are you have to be exactly who you are however it's not the worst thing to see where you fit where is the most match from uh, who you are to where you fit and actually frankly with what's selling because this is a business Book is a book is a product. That's how they talk about it in the, in a sales meeting. If if you want to go that traditional way, then you have to think a little bit along those lines. Not change yourself, but be the best you can be. That that lines up with that product. What lines up with what the marketplace wants. Um, there is great. a word. There is a word that's dangerous out there and that word is success okay be really careful how you use that word for yourself and for others if my definition of success was being a best-selling author 35 years ago when my first book didn't do anything and i felt crappy about myself then i would have stopped okay so you need to Define success for yourself, maybe even daily. Did you write a great paragraph? Have you figured out how to write dialogue maybe better than you did the day before? Did you meet a deadline for a contest? Fantastic. What else do you want from yourself? <laughs> you know, that is, that is a successful day. Really? That's wonderful. <laughs> anyway. what, what would you like for people to take away from, from Girl and Ice? Oh, from Girl and I, so I just hope they have a, the ride of their life, a terrific adventure, and that their sense of wonder is renewed. I, when I was writing it, I, I, I just, I do find the Arctic environment just full of mystery and wonder and we crave mystery as much as we try to solve the mystery we need mystery we need wonder in our lives yes so i want people to also feel 
that they're so much braver than they think they are. Like, we are so much braver than we realize. Mm, So with everything that you're trying to go through in life and you're scared and you're scared and you're scared, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. You're just, you're, you know, we contain multitudes. We do. All of you. Yes. Erica, you you are a a true inspiration to everybody. (laughs) All these writers. Yes, you are. Yes. And and the book is is very interesting, and I encourage everybody to pick it up. We thank you. Talking with Erica Forensic and her, all about her book, her latest book, er, uh, "Girl in Ice." Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Doris. It's been a major pleasure. Thank you so much.